Coder Career with me, your host, Cameron Blackford. Today's guest is JJ Johnson. JJ's worked for some of the largest technology companies in the world. He's consulted for a wide variety of enterprises and has also worked at startups. So he's really seen a lot of the tech world and will be able to provide some really valuable insight for junior developers who want to upskill and get to those lead positions. JJ joins us to discuss his unconventional journey into tech, living and working in Tokyo, and his advice for the tech professionals of tomorrow. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's episode of The Coder Career is brought to you by the Zero to Mastery Academy. Figuring out the right technologies, tools, and practices to learn is a challenge in of itself. Zero to Mastery has a ton of resources to help you actually work out what you need to learn, and then after that, teach you those valuable skills. Their courses are consistently updated to ensure that they have the most up-to-date practices, technologies, and toolings. I particularly recommend their original Zero to Mastery course and their Junior to Senior web development course, which teaches you all kinds of concepts around JavaScript and will have you developing scalable, full-stack web applications. You can find a link to Zero to Mastery in the description, and membership is as low as $23 US a month. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Afternoon, JJ. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Yeah, not not too bad. Thanks. Not too bad. Uh, a little bit cold in Scotland, but um, yeah, can't complain. It's what I signed up for after all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just for the listeners who maybe aren't familiar with you, do you want to give a bit of a background into who you are and what your story is? Uh, sure. So uh, I am JJ. I uh, have been in the as a web developer for goodness knows, I had 23 years at this point. I came out of academia, um, entered into uh, this um, marketplace right when the dot-com bubble burst, which was not the best time. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, I've been here ever since, worked for a wide variety of companies, uh, currently serving as a cloud application architect. I guess you've seen a lot of the major milestones in tech during during that time then. I mean, the first one being quite an obvious one with the dot-com bubble. So there's definitely a lot to go through there. Absolutely. Cool. So what I normally like to do is go through quick fire questions. So the audience uh, gets to know a little bit more about you um, that way as well. So uh, I, the first one is always, is always a good one. What was your first ever computer? Uh, that was unfortunately... The uh, Apple Performa 636 CD, which was absolutely horrible. (laughs) Um, I had actually never, besides using an Apple 2E with the five and a quarter floppy disk, uh, this was the first kind of modern computer I had ever had. Uh, my mom bought it for me when I entered into college and mm. had to have a roommate actually show me what in the world, you know, to how, how in the world I can actually use the dang thing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that kind of sparked the love and uh, it's it stayed with me ever since. <laughs> Very nice. So would that have had a, was that a command line based system or, or was it graphical interface by that point? It was a graphical interface. Oh, nice, nice, cool. Yeah, I've heard a, a lot of those Apple machines um, for, uh, from the period where Steve Jobs was kicked out. I, I heard they weren't very good. Um, it, was that what you found, or uh, she said, unfortunately? Yeah, it was horrible. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was slow. It was clunky. Uh, it it did not endear me to Apple by any means of the word. Um, luckily, um, after. I had started uh, doing full-time development. I had found Linux uh, after using the command line version only of Linux through Plex. And uh, yeah, that's what captured my love from that point out. Uh, so I, even though I do use you know MacBooks now because it makes development a heck of a lot easier, uh, Linux is always going to be my you know first great love, I would say. I, I was just saying to someone at uh, my job today, uh, my, my motto is if someone else is paying for it, go Mac. Uh, if you're paying for it, go Linux. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, we're, uh, we're we're talking from opposite uh, sides of the pond here, so it might be quite an interesting uh, answer for this one. What's your favorite tech city in the world? I'm still going to have to say Tokyo. Oh, uh, nice. Have Have you been before? I have. I, I lived in Tokyo for two years or so. Uh, actually, I hope to move back in maybe a year and a half or two years. Uh, 
my wife's family. I met my wife there. Um, I still have family there. Uh, I want to go back. But yeah, just from uh, the everything from uh, PASMO, which drives uh, the uh, your Metro card. Uh, I mean, just doing rough off the book numbers. PASMO accepts roughly, you know, a, a couple of million transactions per minute. It's just mind boggling how it goes through. Um, the business culture in Japan may not be like the absolute best because, you know, overwork is still very much a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, just from the, it, it's, it's really, you get this really interesting dichotomy. Uh, you have, uh, you know, amazing technological progressives, but yet half of the uh, restaurants that you go to still only accept cash. So it's it's a really kind of weird uh, interplay there, but yeah, I absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, you paint a great picture. It's somewhere where I've wanted to go uh, for years, ever since I was a kid, really. Uh, and I, I hopefully, I was kind of originally trying to get there sort of roughly this year, uh, but obviously... Uh, we've had a uh, had a bit of a global situation for the past eighteen months or so, or getting on two years now. Uh, exactly. So that's uh, delayed things somewhat. But yeah, I've, I'd absolutely love to go out there. That uh, that sounds that sounds really cool. W- were you working out there or studying? I-, I was working over there. Oh, nice. Was that was that um, was that a developer job or was that when you were in academia? Uh, that was a developer position. I used to run the all of the kind of front end business assets for a cell phone insurance company, and they decided to set up a a new business over in Japan for uh, KDDI. So I went over there as a uh, a portal engineer to try to set up all of their uh, front end software running this for this new uh, software insurance plan they were setting up. Oh, nice. That, uh, that sounds like an awesome experience to be a it part was, of. It was great. I, I, I loved every single minute of it. Fantastic. Uh, sounds good. Um, we're, we're talking a little bit about um, about code now, but uh, when, when you are coding, uh, what music powers you? Uh, J-Rock. Nice. Stay say. with the Japanese I'm theme. Yeah, uh, it uh, that's pretty much all I listen to besides some like old throwback uh, music from when I was a teenager. But yeah, pretty much everything is uh, is Japanese based for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, a lot of good, a lot of good arts and technology come out of there. Are there any uh, bands you'd recommend I'd listen to? Uh, yeah, actually. So like a really uh, kind of popular one. Uh, let me actually, uh, I will look up my, uh, Google, uh, playlist. Oh, oh, uh, Rad Wimps is really kind of popular. Uh, so if you want to stick in like the top 40, that's great. Uh, Mad Kid is also good. Um, yeah, th- there's just so many I can't even begin to, you know, <laughs> to run through them all. But, uh, Oral Cigarettes is another one. So yeah, there's some great stuff out there. Yeah, I, that sounds really good. I'm quite into rock music, so uh, be uh, quite keen to check a, check a few of those bands out for sure. And um, what what about when when uh, you you code quite literally? Would you say you're early bird or night owl? Night owl. If I go to bed before two a.m., it's kind of a, a miracle. Wow, that's quite something to hear. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, uh, with my current project, uh, so I work in ProServe, which is we uh, serve customers and help them transition into uh, cloud native type of solutions. And I'm currently working with a company in Brazil. And of course, they're in our, uh, um, you know, our time zones make it so that I have to get up very early for stand up. <laughs> So yeah, it's not the most ideal situation in the world, but my body clock just won't let me readjust. So. <laughs> it's, I think the night hours are winning. In t- so this will be, when this comes out, I think this will be episode 17. And I think we've had like a good 11, 12 night hours versus five early birds. So uh, I, it seems like technical people definitely lean towards night hour because a couple of those early birds were recruiters. So they weren't actually coders. So Quite quite interesting to see most most devs like working on uh, working later on. I wonder if it's a way maybe our brains are wired because I'm definitely a night owl myself. It could be because I can honestly only think of a handful of like true like 
heavy developers that I know which have shifted more into the early early bird status. Almost everyone I know is, an, is a true night owl. The common answer I often get is if someone's got young kids, they find that they become an early bird because it's been enforced or something <laughs> like that. But, uh, or even in some cases, a dog that wants to be let out to the garden at five in the morning. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a funny one. Sometimes life can... Um, kick your natural circadian rhythm because of your responsibilities. But uh, I'm someone that doesn't really have any responsibilities. So I'm happy to default to my night owl uh, sort of nat- natural natural ways. Um, and what, I mean, you've had a very interesting career transition from, and that's definitely something we'll go into uh, more depth in, later in the pod. Um, but pre the academia days, even when you were a kid in, in school, what, what job did you want to do when, when you were an adult? Okay, this is going to be a weird answer. I want it to be a cryptozoologist. That is a pretty cool answer. Uh, I've got to say, <laughs> I, I assume you've heard of the big, the big crypto uh, cryptozoologist. Um, I can't think of the right word uh, for the uh, mysterious animal in, of Scotland. You, you must have heard of Loch Ness, right? Oh, oh God, <laughs> yes. In fact, it's been a dream to be able to go out and, and visit the lot. Because, uh, yeah, I fell in love with Nessie from a kid. Uh, in fact, there used to be this old series of uh, Time Life books that they would pump out about mysterious, you know, creatures or strange phenomena. And, uh, yeah, my, my mom was lucky and was, you know, nice enough to be able to get me that because I was so into it. And it just fueled my imagination. I actually run a podcast myself in which we look at academic topics of like demonology and angelology. So even when I was in academia, that kind of fueled my kind of interest into what I really wanted to study. So that that's really cool. That's really cool. Are there any uh, any any kind of underrated sort of stories and mysteries around animals that uh, maybe aren't as famous as Nessie or or the Yeti uh, that you would recommend people check out? Um, I have honestly, I haven't even looked into that stuff in so long. The only one that really kind of sticks out is supposed to be a a, a pygmy dinosaur that lived in the Congo. Mm. strangely enough. Um, and there were supposed to be tales that uh, a tribe actually ate, uh, like captured and ate one, and they all mysteriously died, supposedly. Oh, wow. it, it was all kind of weird. But yeah, that and uh, King Puma, which was actually one of the cryptids that was determined to actually to like really exist. So, you know, it was it was really kind of interesting. Yeah, I read a, uh, I, I can't remember if it was like an online uh, long read or, or, or some kind of book on this, uh, but a really uh, interesting one about how um, it's actually more uh, real than people think because stuff like 150 years ago, they had no idea that a colossal squid was even a thing. And now it's been widely proven. Uh, and I guess exactly. especially with marine life, like there must be all sorts lurking down there that we don't know about. It scares me a bit, but it's very interesting to think about. Oh, it's amazing. Like, I, I love watching uh, science related uh, uh, YouTube channels and uh, just the sheer amount of new species that are discovered every single year. But yeah, uh, actually, the, um, uh, the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum, um, at least they did. I haven't been there in a while because of the pandemic, uh, but they had a actual giant um a squid uh on display and the thing is just mind-bogglingly massive it was amazing yeah it's what uh, one of those things that sailors come back from sea and they they sort of talk about talk about these mysteries and then actually it turns out to be based in reality it's so often the case with human history and everything i, I find all that stuff fascinating that's really cool Absolutely. <laughs> and um, in, in terms of going more back to the code side of things, uh, reluctantly, um, <laughs> your, your, your journey is really interesting because um, we've talked about the academia a little bit, but we haven't actually said uh, what you specialize in. It's totally different to, uh, to web technologies, really, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, so I, in college, I specialized in uh, postmodern philosophy and systematic theology, which are things that are completely at odds with each other. Uh, luckily, my college that I went to, they offered a, uh, a special program that allowed you to spend essentially 
half of your senior year concentrating upon one or two particular topics and write a massive paper at the end that was essentially a master's thesis. Uh, so yeah, I, I got to actually change my major into those two very specific items. And uh, when I went over into grad school, um, I had to choose between religion and philosophy. And I went with religion because my focus there was in Semitic philology, uh, mm -hmm. which is tr um, not only translating ancient ling ancient Semitic languages like Hebrew and et cetera, uh, but was also trying to get back to a figurative um, uh, root language that could have spawned all of them, uh, mm -hmm. but also uh, looking at the Pseudepigrapha, which is a collection of writings between the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament, uh, that really only one religion still uh, values as a holy text, uh, that would be the Ethiopic Orthodox Church. And that happened to be the language that I specialized in, which is classical Ethiopic or Ge'ez. Um, in fact, I'm writing a, uh, an automatic translator now for Ge'ez so that I can uh, try to help out some uh, research uh, facilities that are still trying to rapidly translate text. Wow, that's that's quite something. And you um, did did you decide to switch to tech because uh, you thought that you could use some of the analysis skills that you'd taken, um, or was it more that you kind of done you felt like you'd served academia for for long enough? What what was your uh, reasoning to to move on? Uh, so while I was in both college and grad school, um, I had the chance to work, um, in various programming languages. So at my college, I was the research bibliographer of the, um, of the religion department. And there I kind of had to develop, uh, custom, um, uh, a custom programming language in hypertext, which was an old Apple programming language in order to classi uh, classify CVs for incoming professors. Uh, and I really loved that. And then when I went into grad school, um, I became a, um, uh, the uh, one of the uh, webmasters uh, for the Andover Harvard Theological Library. And there I got to update their websites in addition to doing other menial tasks around the library. And uh, then I went on to become uh, a, a worker at the uh, Center for the Study of World Religions. And there I actually got to do like some flash animation and some more um, basic uh, HTML and see, I'm what, just HTML at that point. CSS wasn't even a thing at that point. And um, yeah, I, I fell in love with it. And so when I graduated, it was either, well, I could spend 10 more years to get a PhD or I could go into tech and earn more money than what I could be as a professor. And I would still be able to scratch that itch of being able to problem solve. I love translating ancient languages. I used to spend like 10 hours in the library doing that a day. Um, I even was able to be on a, a, a uh, only a doctorate council uh, for a student because she couldn't find um, a, a, a classical Ethiopic uh, translator. So I, I got to be able to be a part of all of that efforts and I loved it. But at the end of the day, you know, I had to look after my own security in addition to, you know, what can allow me to hit the ground running and still be able to solve all of these really fascinating problems on a day in day out basis and uh t at tech at the end of the day won out handily that's uh that's really interesting and i definitely agree with you about the, the scratching the itch idea because if you have a real strong interest in something and i think people that have ended up in in tech we find that we're, we're able to get the same itch we've got from other stuff um in programming and that that's really uh that's really cool and you you mentioned graduating around the um, the dot com era. How, how would you say that since that between then and 2021, where we are now, how's the industry evolved in terms of culturally and also as well the technology we've used and like what what have you learned that uh, has meant that you've been able to keep up with all of that stuff? Oh, it, it has changed dramatically. So when I got into it, you know, um, HTML. Uh, all structure of HTML was still being controlled through tables. And at the time, I could 
I could take any printed material and translate that into nested table upon nested table and get you a one-to-one, uh, you know, exact image for how that would translate into a web page. Um, and CSS wasn't even a glimmer at that point. JavaScript was mainly used for shaking browser windows through thunder effects at the point. Um, and then when it comes to just deployment, there was essentially nothing besides, you know, FTP. Now, uh, you know, over the years, I have reinvented my skill set uh, probably eight or nine times uh, to not only keep up with the latest and greatest, but also to, uh, to, to make life easier. So, you know, for example, uh, I'm huge into DevOps now because I absolutely hate having to do a manual process in, in order to deploy something. Uh, it has to be 100% reliable over thousands of iterations, no matter what you do. Um, you know, I love serverless technologies. Uh, if I can get away from maintaining my own infrastructure and write serverless code in order to do what I want it to do, then fantastic. Um, that's what I'll do. Uh, so yeah, it had, it had progressed to, well, let's learn this monster of a thing called CSS um, and try to get away from table-based layouts, which, you know, took a little bit of doing, but in the end was easy enough uh, to now, um, you know, let, let's learn everything there is to know about cloud and how to actually do proper DevOps and a really kind of transition things to be much more reliable and scalable instead of having to scale vertically, let's scale horizontally and be done with it. And let's include nifty things like auto healing and, you know, um, uh, auto reparation. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been fantastic from that standpoint. Yeah. That, um, that is very interesting because, I guess obviously DevOps as a job only really came about actually only a few years ago. So just the yep. industry even shifting in, in, in that respect, we now have a huge job that wasn't a thing before um, is uh, very, it's very kind of clear how much has changed compared to lots of other industries. And I, something I've quite kind of a specific question that I was curious about, uh, would, what, what would you say had a bigger impact on uh, the tech industry? I guess you can only speak for the States and I suppose Japan as well. Would you say um, the dot-com bubble or the 2008 global crash um, had a bigger effect on the tech industry for developers? I would say the, the 2008, mm. honestly, um, mainly because tech was still very much in, in its infancy uh, back then whereas in 2008 things were beginning to gel just a little bit more in terms of just if you think back on it uh, there used to be a lot of um a lot of analysis around the internet and just websites in general as to being held together with, uh, with, you know, bubble gum and tape. And that was very true. Everything was highly manual at that point. Uh, but then people began to realize, well, there's got to be a better way of going about this. And now, even though there is still a degree of that bubble gum and tape kind of mentality, uh, most places now, you know, have, rigorously uh, define their release processes, uh, the SDLCs, and things are much more scalable and reliable than they ever were before. And I think that the 2008 market crash really kind of forced people to help accelerate that trend a good bit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I can, I can see I can see why, because in my head, I, was, I would agree and always bias towards 2008, but I'm only curious about that because I was a teenager when it happened and therefore much more aware of it. The, um, I've only uh, really, I mean, I wasn't really paying attention uh, when I when I just started primary school. So uh, for the, uh, the, the dot-com um, crash, but I, I've read a lot about it and the whole pets.com story and everything like that has always been very interesting to me. So uh, that's interesting. Actually, the, the interesting thing is, is I was actually working for Fannie Mae um, at the time as a uh, business architect. Um, and, you know, Fannie Mae is one of these industries in the U.S. that really helps to drive mortgage, the U.S. mortgage market. Uh, so, yeah, I was actually kind of 
even though I didn't have like any true like back end sense of what was going on, um, just like everyone else, got, I got my news from NPR, you know, public radio. Um, but still, it was kind of interesting to be on the ground floor, when, you know, and actually at ground zero when all of that kind of began to occur. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And I mean, obviously, because we need we have to be aware, especially with stuff like uh, we've recently had a bit of a crash with COVID. Um, we need to make sure we're rolling with the punches. And you've mentioned how you managed to re- reinvent your skills uh, repeatedly. Is there any kind of strategy you've taken um, that maybe the listeners could could pick up for uh, for learning when you when you're already working a full time job and maybe have a busy schedule? Um, side projects. Mm find something that interests you uh you know it's always good to I mean, the the great thing is is that with the net now there are so many resources so many content creators that are trying to go through and teach other people exactly how to make use of new skills new languages whatever it may be um so it's easy to consume this but yet you can't really make it your own until you have gone through an entire project and looked at all of the minuscule you know steps that people don't think to really broadcast out but yet you realize without this you really can't really do anything with it that much um so yeah find a project that you like uh you know whether it's uh, and there are so many cheap ways of doing that now especially with like netlify um if you're into web development where you can stand up your own uh, website easily you can have different uh Uh, stages of that website whether it be dev test production whatever you want to call it Um, and then you can create your own you know serverless infrastructure it kind of ties into github Uh, it allows you to you know create uh, great ci cd pipelines just right off the bat that are very easy to uh, to manipulate Um, but yeah find something that enables you to do a side project get as much of the um uh, of the ancillary things uh, either taken care of for you through uh, some mechanism or another uh, to really allow you to focus on one particular aspect that you're li- trying to learn and then just finish out a side project get it out there introduce it to the world um and then only then can you like really say okay now i think i know enough to be able to be dangerous with this technology so <laughs> Yeah, that sounds really good. And I, I totally agree. And for people that wonder um, what they should do as a side project, uh, I always say to people, think of a problem you want to solve and build a web app to solve that problem. doesn't matter what, what it is, like it can be something big or small. Um, and there's always some kind of full stack web application uh, that you can make to solve that problem. And I echo uh, your uh, sentiment on uh, Netlify. It's, it's great. And the free tiers um, of a lot of these uh providers have become increasingly generous because there's so much competition so it's great if you're a developer even better if you're a full-time student because there's so many offers um way but you can you can build so much and maybe just buy a domain name for uh 10 pounds or 10 dollars and you know you're you're absolutely set so it's uh yeah it's the world the world's your oyster as a as a developer in 2021 uh even since i learned to code uh back in 2018 uh the amount of resources have increased so much um in 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 just three or four years so it's it's crazy oh yeah i mean yeah it used to be that you know if you wanted to have a website like i used to have everything on amazon uh which you know is fantastic but even for kind of their free tier if you want to go you know start exploring some of their other services i was still spending around 25 bucks a month and mm-hmm. then when i found netlify and it allowed you to do serverless functions in the back end uh that 25 dollars went down to zero and yeah. my netlify site is running like it's running my podcast website uh, everything is a serverless based function it's using mongodb in the back end which is using their atlas service and i'm on the free tier for it so that cost me zero and so yeah i pay nothing besides the uh, domain name and it's been fantastic yeah if the big companies are happy to pick up the bill let's let them (laughs) exactly (laughs) and um you 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 already touched on uh your current job and your current role a little bit already uh but for listeners who aren't that familiar can you explain um what what it is that you do and what a typical day might look like for someone in your position 
Uh, sure. So as a cloud application architect, um, I and I, I serve in a pro serve type of role. Um, so typically, if a company needs assistance in getting their stuff up into the cloud or to um, uh, to re imagine how they can go from more uh, legacy tech over into say cloud native technology uh, then they will hire uh, our company's pro serve arm to mm -hmm. jump in and try to help them out and um, yeah so i typically the way that my job functions is um, i'm on a wide variety of uh, of uh, projects uh, i work on some internal projects so i'll create code in order to help other people um, you know advance some serverless uh, tech in their own um, uh, sphere uh, but otherwise i am fully dedicated to a client and I'm helping them out. I'm attending standups. Um, I'm coding for them. I'm writing artifacts to show best practices. So the one thing I love about my current position is that I get to do a thousand and one things. And what I've always looked for in a position is one, I'm able to make a a huge impact upon whatever I'm working on, whether it's a company, whether it's a project, et cetera. But two, that day one is as radically different as day two, and that continues onward. Um, and that has been very true for this position that I find myself in. Uh, so not only do I get to solve really challenging uh, and sometimes entirely brand new issues because we're working at such magnificent scale, um, but two, I get to solve a lot of different kinds of problems all over the, t all over the place for a lot of different people. And uh, just from a networking perspective, um, to an interesting problem set perspective uh, and the fact that I'm not constrained into the technology that I use. So I get to use a thousand different tools all in a day. And uh, yeah, it's been just absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. That, uh, that, that sounds really good. And you obviously work for quite a large organization at the moment. And would, what would you say the differences are between working in a large organization and a small organization for maybe listeners that have only worked in one or even are looking for their first job right now? Um, would you say there's any major benefits or drawbacks to, to each one? Uh, yes. Um, the larger the organization that you work for, the more well-defined and pigeonholed that position is going to be. So yes, you may have, if you work for a smaller company, you're going to get to do a lot more things. So your job position is going to have a greater latitude to it. Um, so you can find yourself, um, you know, doing marketing one day and then another day you're helping out with the website and another day you're helping out with the client. So you'll find yourself doing a lot of different kinds of activities. Um, if you work for a larger organization, then your position is going to be much more well-defined. So yes, you should always strive to achieve and this is something that I think that a lot of developers kind of lose track of. Tech is still a customer service industry. Um, if your clients are not happy, and that usually means the business that you're working for, uh, then you're probably not going to have a job for too much longer. Um, so striving for ultimate customer service, no matter what kind of position that you're in, is going to benefit you in the long run. Uh, but when you work for a larger organization, your ability to kind of branch out from your role is going to be a little bit less. Um, it's going to be more limited um, just in general. Uh, so, you know, fortunately the position that I'm in is the ultimate in terms of, um, of, le uh, you know, of being able to be flexible because you're just throwing a hundred different problem sets and you get to pick and choose what you want to work on. Uh, but if you're not in that type of role, then you know, you're going to find yourself a little bit more constrained. And that may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. Uh, for example, I kind of wish that I was working, I was working for a bit of a smaller organization um, so that I could grow it much more organically uh, than the role that I'm currently able to do in my current role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. It, may, it makes sense. And 
Would you say for someone's first job, in your opinion, is it better to go startup or large corporate? Uh, there's a couple of factors in that. So <clears throat> if you want more latitude in your job in, in what you do, then I would say startup is great. If you care about work-life balance, you probably want to go for corporate. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, there are, and I'm not saying every startup is like this, but a lot of startups, they just emphasize on, we need to get this done. And they don't really care about the material impacts upon the people that are doing those tasks. Now, I have worked at a startup. I was the director of engineering. Uh, I was essentially their first tech hire. I built out new teams, but I was also working 70, 80 hours a week and it wrecked my health. Um, so yeah, it, uh, you know, I always encourage, even if you think that you can do it, um, unless it's your very own company, you know, always preserve your work-life balance because it's only going to benefit you in the end. Yeah, it, it's funny. There's this strange idea. I don't know if it's the same in the States, but I found in the UK, there's a strange idea that people think that work-life balance is better in startups. And I found it's anything but the case. Like I, my current company, uh, I wouldn't say we're big corporate, but we're a uh, small corporate. So we're a tech-led uh, real estate agency. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, we have uh, about uh, 100 people in our in our tech department. Uh, we're publicly traded. So we're relatively well known. Like the average person on the street here in the UK will probably know who we are. Uh, but the, the work-life balance is amazing here. Uh, and not to knock any of my previous employers, um, they've all been great places to work. I've never really worked anywhere bad. But um, the work-life balance hasn't been... Uh, anywhere near as good at um, a lot of startups I've I've worked at in my life. Um, so it, it's a it's a funny one. Um, it's a funny one where the reputation for corporate is quite bad. The only downside is you get pigeonholed sometimes, but uh, you just need to know that going in. I think so. Uh, yeah, um, it's an interesting thing to consider for someone going into their uh, first role. I mean, kind of related to that. Uh, if someone came to you now and, and said, you know, oh, I've just left school, I've just left university, uh, I want to get into tech, um, specifically, I want to be a developer, what would you advise them to do uh, in the current market? That is a great question. I So I have daughters that have, uh, you know, just graduated from uh, college and they were in CS and, you know, this is kind of what I recommended them to do i said you know go find side projects uh, do them build up a uh, a resume so even if you can't find work immediately then you're able to showcase your own skills uh to whatever you know job opportunities you're happy you happen to find um and but while doing that make sure that you bulletproof your uh your resume or your your cv um you know have other people review that uh, especially if you have people in your network that have been in the industry for a while get them to review it uh, say how can i build this up because one of the ultimate tools that i have is a well refined uh resume which is essentially now a cv because it goes on for pages upon pages and i i have different versions of it i have a pared down version for companies that don't really want to see that or in the area of the of the country that i'm in uh, we actually use kind of technical cvs which can run on for multiple pages and i have a full-fledged version which i can overwhelm someone with the amount of crap that i've done in my <laughs> life uh so yeah if you if you ab- make sure that you're advertising yourself um and that uh, you also are refining your skills and adding more skills to you, then uh, I think that's going to position you really well whenever you're looking for a job. Uh, absolutely. And a good, a good CV or resume uh, is, um, is your number one weapon uh, for, uh, for, cause it, for, for getting into role because it's the first thing a hiring manager sees. Obviously, I used to be a recruiter. Uh, that's my whole sort of niche on this uh, podcast. And it, you know, I, uh, for a junior job, you're gonna, it's the only one where uh, it's the only tech job where the market is weighted in favor of the company and not the candidate. Uh, and you see a lot of CVs and um, 
it's it's sort of thing where at a glance a good CV can really uh, make the difference. And I absolutely uh, agree with you about getting anyone you know in the industry to to review it, or even failing that, just get your course mates or classmates to uh, give it a give it a look over. Because the last thing you want to do is send out a CV with a load of spelling mistakes on. Like I, I did it once, and in fact, I got rejected for uh, when I was looking for my first developer job. Um, I got rejected because I uh, put that I worked somewhere in, um, I think I put that I worked somewhere in the year 3000. Um, and I got a very, <laughs> I got quite a sharp email back actually from the hiring manager saying, uh, uh, just full stop, we don't, we don't accept, uh, we don't accept CVs with mistake, uh, with date mistakes on. Uh, and I didn't know what he was talking about. And I looked and I was like, oh, right. I was a thousand years off uh, on my experience there. But Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I so I have built up numerous dev teams for different companies uh, where I've had to hire anywhere from you know a handful all the way up to like fifteen individuals to work at a company, and so I have gone through probably hundreds of thousands of resumes and CVs, and uh, yeah, it's really quickly when you're in that kind of a position, you you come to realize what a good resume looks like and what a really bad one looks like. Um, so yeah, the more, the more advice and inputs that you get, the better off you're going to be. Absolutely. And, uh, as well, always worth, always worth asking, um, the people who, if you have managed to get a friend in industry who, who reviews it, always worth asking if one, their company is hiring and two, uh, they, they can refer you because a lot of the time, uh, you get a cash bonus, um, if you refer someone in and some companies are extremely generous. Uh, I've heard of them. The highest I've heard of in here is a ten thousand pound bonus for a successful um, referral of a senior developer. Uh, so it's you can actually financially really benefit from a friend uh, referring you in as well. So it's a good way to good way to get your foot in the door. Absolutely. Related to that as well, are there any tools or technologies that you'd recommend? Um, I guess we're talking to someone who's already learned to code uh, here. Uh, if they want to get a job and but be future proof as well, and ideally be happy with their tech for the next few years, is there any anything emerging that you'd recommend that maybe people check out and learn? Um, so I am a huge proponent of Node.js. Um, I ever since because uh, I found it back in like point ten. Uh, when it was out in its release cycles and fell in love with it. And I've been using it ever since. Um, you know, uh, JavaScript is kind of a, a, a universal tool at this point. Uh, it can be used in the front end, on the back end. Um, you know, going for it is definitely going to be able to keep you very much in demand, especially if you know Node.js and you can apply that to uh, Lambda functions for uh, serverless computing, then that is always fantastic. Learning cloud uh, is always going to be a, a great uh, avenue because a lot of companies are trying to go for more cloud native um, and that entails a lot of different architectures. It entails no longer doing everything from within, within code, but rather to do things through configuration instead. So whether you're looking at um, Kubernetes, whether you're uh, you know looking at like circuit breaker patterns or retry policies, you know all of that can now be done through configuration rather than just through trying to implement all of that through code. Um, so yeah, learning the latest uh, cloud tech. Uh, whether that's, you know, uh, Amazon, whether it's another company, always a fantastic thing to do. And then lastly, you know, if you're more into web development, uh, you know, even if you happen to, to know one of the front end frameworks really well, let's say that, you know, React, like the back of your hand, that's great. Um, maybe learn Vue as well or learn another competing um, uh, front end because even though the company that you're looking at or you're currently working for is, you know, specialized in that one, uh, maybe you'll find a slightly different way of going about it uh, for another company. So being able to have that kind of outside perspective and knowing, you know, some of the advantages of handling things one way versus another is always going to uh, to be fantastic. Because honestly, in the web development world, we still kind of look at people through the lens of, you know, junior developer, you know, mid-tier, midshipman um, versus senior developer. And the way that you progress up those levels is 
How much do you know about all of the ecosystems? How much can you actually reliably run production web environments or craft an entire new component from scratch and be able to have that run in production reliably? Um, you know, and the more that you know, the faster you're going to be able to be considered uh, a tier up from where you are currently. Yeah, I, absolutely. And uh, particularly, it's always good to have um, a second way of doing everything. Like, for example, if you're a, a backend developer who works in Python, then, you know, it might be might be a good idea to learn Node.js as well. Uh, it's like having a good uh, backup option, like a secondary weapon or uh, it's like it's like you wouldn't have a toolbox with only a flathead screwdriver and, and no Phillips head or crosshead. Um, you would have both because it's yep. useful to have both options. Uh, and in this respect, it might be because, you know, for, for a job, you might need to... Uh, take on a migration um project or or even just you know it's just good to understand the perspective like i don't use it anymore day to day but i had to learn angular for a previous job and i'm really glad i did because i learn um i learned how that all works and it's totally different from react which is what i use day to day now so it's it's a very yeah uh that's a very long way of me saying i totally agree with you um about <laughs> learning um learning different different areas and obviously we all know cloud's absolutely exploding at the moment so um it's but that is a really good point, though, of, you know, even if you let's say that you happen to know Node.js or, you know, Python, um, you know, learning how to how to program in different languages is only going to benefit you in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Python. I do a lot of Node.js. Uh, you know, I've worked in a dozen other languages, you know, to date. Uh, and I always find something interesting that I can take even to my preferred language that I get to work on. Uh, so, yeah, it, you know, that's only going to benefit you in the end. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think a good a good website uh, that you can practice like for like stuff on in different languages is Code Wars uh, because you can solve a problem. Um, usually it's like an algorithm style problem. You can, you can solve a problem in say JavaScript and then switch the puzzle over to Python and then solve it again. And you can compete and see how quickly it compiles and everything like that. So, uh, oh, I definitely awesome. recommend Co yeah, code wars is really cool. Um, you, you'd like it actually, cause it's got a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the stuff is based on, um, like Japanese, uh, samurai and, uh, ninja sort of rankings and that kind of thing. Uh, so it leans quite into the Japanese, uh, quite inspired by the Japanese, uh, cult, uh, like war, war and samurai culture. Uh, so it's pretty cool. That is awesome. I will absolutely check that out. I yeah. love learning about stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. And um, for any anyone listening, like whether you're an entry level developer or a, a senior uh, engineer, there's there's um, there's a ton of different challenges on there that are um, are worth checking out on every level. Like uh, I often just um, do it for sort of 10, 15 minutes um, before I start work just to almost kind of warm up my brain a little bit. It's quite a lot of fun uh, to scratch the itch. So yeah, Code Wars, link will be in the description. And uh, honestly, the ability to, I mean, actually just practicing your problem solving skills like that, whether it's through Code Wars or through, uh, you know, any other website that poses these kind of brain teasers, uh, that's going to help you in technical interviews across the board because, mm. you know, people are going to want to see, can you code your way out of a wet paper bag? Because <laughs> that's why we're hiring you for it. Um, and if you can't demonstrate that within a, a technical interview, then you're going to be kind of in trouble. But being able to think about these types of algorithms and how you can modify things in a reliable and safe fashion, that's only going to benefit you, especially in these types of uh, high pressure scenarios. Mm, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think that's a, uh, that's a great note to sort of uh, get towards the end of the podcast on. And uh, I just want to say massive thank you for coming on today. Uh, you've been a really insightful guest. Have you got anything you wanted to uh, shout out? Because um, you, you have your own podcast uh, as well, don't you? I do. Yeah. So uh, my podcast is called Southern Demonology. Uh, don't let the name frighten you. Uh, it <laughs> is a, uh, it's an academic podcast that looks at um, angelology, demonology, ghost spirits and monsters, uh, but from an academic perspective. Uh, so we delve into Semitic philology. We delve into languages. Uh, we do a lot of actually Japanese topics, whether it's like yurei, uh, which are or yokai, which are spirits and monsters. 
Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's a fun podcast. Uh, we have a rather large discord group actually. Um, but yeah, southerndemonology.com. And actually all of that's written on Netlify with serverless functions on the back end. So the, it was a kind of a side project that I'm actually going to be revamping here soon. Uh, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a ton of fun, not just from being able to play on a tech side, but also to uh, to be able to look at you know ways that I can use my uh, my uh, academic degrees and uh, continue to keep them fresh uh, even though I'm working in tech you know essentially 24 hours a day now. <laughs> cool, that sounds really good. Links to all that will be uh, in the description as well, listener. Um, but yeah, th- thank you again for coming on. Uh, it's been really awesome to speak and uh, uh, oh, also thing here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a, a lot of fun. Thank you. Likewise, no no worries at all. And uh, all the links to our discussions will be uh, in the in the description. And thank you for tuning in to the Coda Career this week. Um, I've been Cameron, and my guest today has been JJ. We are uh, coming with you every Monday morning, uh, seven a.m. UK time, uh, on all podcast players of choice. Uh, but until then, have a great week and happy coding.